I'm 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 actually a little hesitant using the word humble, but to keep myself the way I've been, I think has been um, really a function of, again, of, as you said, I think self-awareness and just not, you know, not uh, missing, missing my role among these, along with and among people who are highly, highly talented. Welcome to the EQ Gangster Podcast, where you will learn practical tools to grow your mental and emotional health and intelligence to be the best version of yourself, both at work and at home. It is real, raw, and transformational. The journey of emotional growth isn't easy, but it's worth it. I believe in you. Bob, how are you, man? It's good to see you. I'm good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. EQ Gangsters. I am super excited to be interviewing Mr. Bob McCool today. He's a phenomenal guy that I had an opportunity to meet at a, a business event that I had attended. And he, he's just an absolute wealth of knowledge. He has been in leadership and, and observing leaders for literally decades. And Bob, how, how long is, so if you can kind of explain your, your career trajectory, what that arc looked like, and then how long were you specifically a CEO also? Sure. Uh, I, I was actually headed to law school in, uh, in college and had developed a little uh, painting and wallpapering company uh, while in school. I had worked uh, in uh, little construction activities before school, during high school, even when I was young, I had a an older gentleman who was a neighbor uh, who taught me how to lay brick and various things like that. So I had a real interest in construction, but my father had a law degree, and I was interested in the law and wanted to um, wanted to pursue it. But when I graduated, I had this little company going, and so I kept it going. Uh, and thought I'd put law school off for a little while, and I never, never got back to it. To, is the short story. Um, went to work for a small general contractor, and then uh, then a larger general contractor. Spent my career there, and then retired uh, and went with a large healthcare system in the country and handled planning, design, and construction for them. So as CEO, I was CEO for the company for about 10 years, uh, the last 10 years of my 25 years there. And uh, I, I enjoyed it, uh, you know, tremendously and and uh, and wondered if I'd be happy doing something after that. But uh, the company that I had gone with as a first as a consultant and then as an employee was so large that I felt like my my job my role in the company in the in the uh, healthcare company was as challenging as my role as CEO in the construction company. So, wow, wow. that's the trajectory. Yeah, that's great. And and how large were the companies that you were? So the you know the company that you were CEO for 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 a decade and then have since served on the board. How large are those companies? If you can give me an idea of scale. Yeah. So. The construction company that I spent my career with was uh, about 800, 800, 850 million when I left, uh, and and that was in two thousand and three, I think. I, at that time, you know, that was pretty good size. I mean, it seems to me that that might have put us in the top fifty uh, construction companies in the country. It has since grown. Um, several fold to probably three plus, you know, billion. Um, and the construction company for whom I've been on the board for 25 years or so uh, is about the same size now. However, I think their growth has been uh, faster than to get to say three and a half billion or whatever than the company I worked for. When I went on the board, the, the, the company at that time, that that construction company, was probably in the two hundred to three hundred million range. So um, that's that's their comparative size. The uh, the company 
the, the, the healthcare company had a, um, a, an annual spend on construction of anywhere from 800 million to a billion uh, on a per year uh, in their within their system. So it's it's been you know after I left my own little outfit uh, hanging wallpaper and painting at the very beginning, it, it became it became something. Um, they were all very significant. All three of them have been significant companies and significant spends. And uh, and I guess corresponding responsibility and challenges. Absolutely, no, that's tremendous. What does it take to be a good chief executive officer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You'd have to ask somebody who was one. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was. Uh, I'm not an engineer. My degree was in political science, headed to law school, so I'm not an engineer. But I had spent probably more time actually with a hammer on my belt or pouring concrete than many engineers in the construction business. So I came in and into it with not only the passion and, and love for construction, but but also some uh, field experience that was invaluable. Uh, I think that really helped. Uh, I think to have gone through and nothing and there's not, obviously nothing wrong in there. It's preferred, I guess, to be an engineer as a CEO of a construction company, possibly an architect, but mostly engineers, I think, civil engineers to a great degree. There's nothing wrong with that, but to have gone through school and really never spent time in the field, I think uh, was was uh, would be something that, you know, if I had missed, I don't know that I would have um, related as much to the to the to the business from the very uh in you know the ground level to the top of the business level or board level so i think it takes someone with um with a keen interest in the business i and and really a love for the business itself love for building not just the business aspect of it that is can be very similar at times to any other kind of business with finance and strategy and and so on and so forth but i think in construction i think it really helps to love what you do and love the, and love what the company makes so i know there are some people who are really experts at business and could plug themselves into any business and and really do well in it um, that's not that is not what I what, where I came from. Uh, it's just as good for them, but I think I had to really love what I do and what and what the company did in order to be a halfway decent CEO. Um, and I think you know it's all about people. And I think to be to be a a good CEO, I think it's important to relate to people and and relate to those people in the company and and what they're going through and what they're dealing with and um you know i i've been involved over the years in in a number of um either terminations or or separations from the company and when an engineer was involved they were never poor engineers they were i i I never had a discussion in terms of a separation or a termination, no matter how friendly or how difficult, uh, when we talked about being lacking in engineering skills, it was always lacking in the, de in a, in the ability to deal with people and whether they were people that the, that engineer was, was leading and organizing or people on the client side or on the other professionals side, architects and outside design engineers, that's where the problems were. And so I think um, we had, we, we, in both companies, I think we have tremendous capability in, in uh, the technical skills of our construction people, our construction leaders in the, in the uh, project management side and executive side but it still takes dealing with people that uh, will make the difference. Absolutely. Wow. That's great. So this may be a very similar answer, but I want to ask it from a different angle to see if there's any more that, that comes up. 
so now that you've been a an executive advisor, an advisor to senior, you know, C level executives for decades now, what type of things are you looking for as an advisor to C level to senior senior leaders in an organization? That's a good question. And it's one that I I'm aware of quite often because I left to my own devices, I would probably want to dig into matters that maybe are outside the purview of board members uh, of, a, of a director. Um, you know, the nuts and bolts. I mean, we there's a difference between what management does and what the board does. And so I have to remind myself to stay as much as I can on board members, although the company that I'm affiliated with <laughs> knows that that's difficult. And I think they appreciate some of the things that that uh, that I really focus on from an operations standpoint, and they let me they they invite me to to those kinds of things. But your question, I think, is is uh, is so interesting because I am looking for different things I in those leaders, and to a great degree, it is about integrity. It's about it's about trust. It's about uh, having the the right the right purpose for the for the business, and following that purpose and and following that that map, so to speak, of what the company is all about, what the company believes in, and uh, and staying on top of that from a, the standpoint of um, of just helping the leaders that we deal with at the board level helping them with they're they're so tied up with the daily challenges and uh, difficulties and successes and people issues that i think sometimes they can they can lose they can lose the ability to uh, to or not the ability but they can lose their focus a little bit sometimes on on uh, keeping the ship headed in the right direction from a from a not just a strategy point of view but mostly i think from a from an ethics and honesty and integrity point of view um and i think it's it's something that as we as we go through a board meeting and we listen and we hear the the reaction of the leadership the management leadership on an issue we can we can bring another viewpoint to that issue without having been so tied up in all the details of the issue. Um, and and so when the CEO or the chair chair or whomever says this is where we came out on that issue, this is what we decided to do. Uh, if if it's missing a little bit of that culture that we're looking for in the company then we can, I think we can help them. And, and, and the company I'm involved in, I'm so fortunate that they, um, they really, they not only appreciate it, they, number one, they expect it. They expect that kind of honesty on our part uh, as board members, um, but they, they also um, value it greatly. And I think they've put together board members who, come from slightly different segments and bring slightly different expertise uh, levels of expertise to the to the board table and each of us is then listening and and kind of monitoring for those things that we're we're focused on when they talk about the the what they're dealing with and each of us can can kind of just nudge them a little bit they're never far off they're never far off the course but we can sometimes we can say something in 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 our individual areas of expertise that um, that help them kind of clear their head and see the direction that we need to go. Excellent. That's that's excellent, Bob. So again, this may elicit some similar responses, but I want to ask a different question to maybe see what it brings out. What of your five decades of leadership and 
observing leaders and being in the leadership world, what have you observed to be some common leadership pitfalls? I well, I, I think self awareness is uh, is is a big issue. Uh, it's you know through my time and either reading or attending uh, educational sessions or um, listening to speakers like you uh, in various uh, venues over the years um, and, a lot, and a fair amount of what I'd call business reading. Um, I think self-awareness has really come through as a, a very, very, very significant um, characteristic and and uh, an attribute that leaders need to have, um, and they and and in doing so, I think you you know I th I think being self aware and working at being self aware keeps a, a leader from losing sight of where they came from, losing sight of how they're experienced by their people primarily and by their clients and associates. So if, if a leader, leader can tend to, you know, become a little bit heavy on the ego uh, because of what they're dealing with, and it might not be their natural style to be egotistical, but but they they read their own press clippings kind of thing. Um, then I think being self aware can can bring you back to theoretically what got you there, the reason you were chosen, the reason you stay in the job, uh, and and not let you stray too far from that. And so I th I think it's just never forgetting our beginnings, um, never forgetting what we went through in in early years and mid years and whatnot and and the experiences we had our mistakes and uh and and just keeping that all in perspective and not getting too hung up with being number one um but uh but you know seeing yourself as a uh, in the healthcare company they talked about being servant leaders and um and that our job is our job isn't to to take or to tell, but to give uh, as a leader, I think, and um, and not really look for what we're going to get out of it, other than the results that we're looking for for the person and for the companies. That's that's huge, and that's 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 definitely you know one of the aspects, one of the main uh, ma major aspects of emotional intelligence, and ironically. Bob, with the, the the leaders that I work with, that is for the majority of the leaders that I work with, that is the starting point where I start with them on is helping them grow and develop their self awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, really put together a, a self awareness kind of track or program, because man, it's it's so interesting that you said that. Uh, because that's an area that a lot of leaders are are lacking and they just need to need to grow in. Um, so, okay. So this is okay. So Bob, how, so a vibe that I get from you and, and from the first day I met you at, at the restaurant and, and the subsequent conversations that we've had, one of, one of the traits that I feel you exhibit is humility. How as a leader, because it kind of ties into the self awareness and never forget where you came from. How have you, how have you maintained that humility from doing? I mean, you've had an a, amazing, I mean, in the business world, I would say a business rock star career, a decade as a CEO from a massive, almost a billion dollar company. You've been consulting and and on boards for multi billion dollar organizations. Yet you seem so humble and still so teachable how do how have you developed and maintained that humility and that teachableness over the span of decades well i i um thank you for saying that uh 
you you maybe overstated it <laughs> significantly, but um, but a bit of, but the the question fits me. Um, you know, I I have to have an answer to that, and I think it's really that you know none of the stuff that I dream up. I mean, I didn't create any of these concepts or ideas or anything, and one of them I didn't create is uh, you know hire people who are smarter than you are, and and better than you are uh, in in their disciplines and as people even. Um, and so <laughs> I am surrounded, I have been surrounded and still am at the board level in, in, uh, in, in many ways it's the same with people who are, um, are so bright, so gifted, uh, had worked so hard to get where they are, continue to work so hard, and to be to be aware of that, to be aware aware of where I fit in in among these people on teams, regardless of what kind of team it is. It, you know, my awareness of where I fit, I'd be in, I'd be crazy. To, to overstate my own importance, to overstate my own intelligence or experience or anything. I mean, I, I just see it as, as experience, li a life experience, a, a career experience that I'm so fortunate to have had, but it's, it's no better than these teammates and and so it i just I, you know i don't see it as having served in a leadership capacity as being deemed the best just de just here's your seat for a time and anyway, i had a consultant years ago who talked about you know first among equals and that resonated with me that i may have that title i may have certain responsibilities but these other people are bringing just tremendous expertise and intelligence and and um, and and care to to what we're doing. And so, you know, I think I think from a business standpoint and a leadership standpoint, I think that I think that's what keeps me somewhat grounded. Where I would hope uh, people would not see me as um as not being humble um i'm sure i could be more humble but in the, in the other side is i i think i grew up that way i think i i grew up i think my parents instilled that in in me and i i sometimes my wife and i will leave a function or an encounter with someone and and she'll ask me what i thought of them and i i have a term that i probably use once in a while and I say they, they, you know, he just seemed puffy. And to me, that's the opposite of humble. Um, and so I don't want to be puffy. And, uh, and I don't see how I could be, I'd have to be, I'd have to be missing all sorts of signals, you know, in, um, <laughs> in placing myself above, or even with some of the people that I deal with. On the board, you know, on the board, my background is construction. My focus is both people and more specifically safety in construction. And then I have an element of tenure on the board because it's been so long. So I have a history on the board. I'm focused on safety. And they know that I'm really super interested in how people function at work. But when we're on high highly sophisticated financial issues i'm not going to jump in and act like i know more than i know or um legal issues um and i've been exposed to lots of legal issues but i'm not an attorney on the board and so i think to keep myself um i'm 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 actually a little hesitant using the word humble but to keep myself the way i've been I think has been um, really a function of, again, of, as you said, I think self-awareness 
and just not, you know, not uh, missing missing my role among these, along with and among people who are highly, highly talented. Thank you for your vulnerability, Bob. How have you, how have you developed your self-awareness or have you always been self-aware? I don't think I've been always self-aware. I actually don't. I actually think I, I started working at it when I was first exposed to it by the reading readings um, in the construction company uh, that, where I worked. We were fortunate in having um, the same consultant group um, and, and really just a few people, a few partners working with us over a long period of time. And so they could, and and I think um, I think to our company's credit, and and the the owner's credit and the chairman's credit, they allowed us to utilize those consultants um, and 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 continue to utilize them. And so the consultants had the ability to be watching us, maybe not on a daily basis, but on a very very regular basis, and. I would have checkups with them on a um, a pretty frequent basis, and the ch- the owner and I would have a meeting with those consultants. I'd say maybe two or three times a year, just on how he and I were working together, and it, and they were pretty straightforward and pretty direct. And some of the things, so you you know, you're asking how did I become or how did I focus on it? But I mean, a lot of it was through mistakes. A lot of it was through um, reminders and and having uh, having instances pointed out to me where I remember one one might have been, you know, where we were in a meeting and and something came up where a client wanted us to do something that really wasn't um, it might not have been, I don't think it was illegal, but it was something that really wasn't the way we operate. And I was upset about it and, and basically dealt with it in a meeting of eight of us where only one other person was the one involved in that. And, um, after I, I dealt with it and I dealt with it somewhat emotionally, um, it, it, you know, controlled, but I mean, that integrity issue was huge. And, and so we're, you know, we, we, we were founded up with integrity or on integrity. We were known for having an integrity and I felt like that was a departure. And so after the meeting, at some point, the consultant who was in the meeting reminded me that, that, that wasn't exactly the right way to do that. Here's how the others experienced you uh, in in doing in handling that the way you handled it, and and so, I was not aware, I, I was not self aware of how that how my my handling it would be received by others, and and how it wasn't as helpful as it should have been, and and so, um, and and I think I think noble. It's really a matter that once I knew how important it was you know, the self-awareness, um, then I, I knew I had to keep my eye on the ball and, and became a big believer in it and see it in others, either see it in its, in its positive state or see somebody that is completely not self-aware, not at all self-aware. And so those were always, you know, if you, if you're thinking about maybe lots of different characteristics, you can find them manifested in people that you're dealing with, you know, like when you walk away from an encounter and saying, wow, that person, that person doesn't have a clue about how, how they're seen, how, how those of us in the meeting experienced her or him. And, and then other times you can walk away and say, man, that was a, that's a professional self-aware expert there, you know, so it's, it's all those things, but it wasn't, I actually think, if I can, you know, both remember and really and really dissect my youth, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can definitely say it's. Not, it, I wasn't born with it. I, I had to work at it. 
Yeah, that's that's excellent. So so you brought up a, an aspect that I'm a big believer in. Just you know, you mentioned the the so one of the one of the tools it sounds like that was impactful for you to help grow and develop your self awareness was was the power of outside feedback. In this case, from a consultant that you're able to get regular and consistent and frequent feedback from, which is, which I, I absolutely love. Can you, in your own words, your own perspective, your own experience, delineate or differentiate from just from, again, your perspective, the difference between a consultant, a coach, and a mentor? Interesting. Well, I'll take a stab at it. I've never, I've never answered a question like that or pondered it on my own. But it's interesting. It's very interesting. Um, I think a consultant, a consultant is, uh, in, in, for me, I think is is really someone who brings expertise that maybe we don't have or I don't have um, and has a has an approach and a and a and a work process that and and the um, the concept that that comes along with it to introduce to a company as a way to achieve a goal that the company has. And I'm thinking in the healthcare company, um, the system, the system engaged one of the premier large national consult consulting companies to come in and, um, and, and look for where there, where we had, um, where we could achieve some value uh that that maybe was not apparent or not hidden and so they're introducing something to us based on their expertise that maybe is new to us a coach it seems like to me you're already working on on known approaches to improvement and so, in other words, the the um, the challenge or the dilemma or the goal is already kind of determined, you know, within reason. I mean, it, it's not set in granite, and it can change and alter a little bit. But but basically, you know, I'm I'm um, I'm too quick to I'm too quick to um, come to a decision and I don't I don't consider options long enough and and quickly enough that's my that's a problem I'm having so I hire a coach to help me with that specific problem and either in witnessing how I'm doing or getting together with me and and going over so what have you been encountering in the last two weeks and well here here's one thing I did and he or she can then say well yeah, this is an example of where you kind of jumped at something and, and didn't take the time to to really um, delve into it and, and get more input on it, listen to other people or whatever. So the coach, you know, that that I think is how I see a coach. I would go to a coach and 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 report kind of and work on um, kind of specific improvement um areas of improvement that I could make the mentor I think the mentor is up there in and dealing with much bigger overarching matters of you know how you treat people what kind of person you are around integrity um around um discipline so not not so specific as a coach and not necessarily bringing like that the value proposition from the large consultant i mean it was a 
it was a huge effort uh, across the company and took my team and we were doing all of our work in the course of the, you know, the, the, in the course of the time and, and, and issues. And it added like tons of meetings on this specific value proposition initiative and had us doing things, you know, digging into data and all sorts of stuff. Well, the mentor, you know, would never, in my mind, would never be engaged in that kind of uh, system approach to, and specificity. But the mentor, if I think about mentors, it's people who've taught me, who've shown me and, and helped me and taught me either um, either implicitly or actively how to be a better person, uh, how to be a better leader in every aspect. Uh, so they're, they'd be, you know, they, they're much, much more personal and private. And, and I think um, without, I never, I, the finest people I've ever met and, and say it's less than six, of the finest, what I'd say the finest, how I determine the finest, those those I would say uh, were were actually mentors, even though none had kind of a title of being a mentor, but they taught me uh, almost subliminally at times. So, for what it's worth, that's that's how I'd see the difference. But as I said, I think it's interesting. I've never I've never thought about it. I've never, I've really never commingled those things. I don't think, even without knowing about, wondering about the differences. I've, I've never thought. I think I need a consultant for this, and then accidentally hired a mentor. You know, right? Or the other way around. So sure. Yeah. yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down. That was great. What questions have you asked, or been asked? that have been transformational? When I went with the healthcare company, it was a religious-based company, private, not public. And after I was hired, I had a about a week where I scheduled, meetings were scheduled for me with the very, very top leaders. And that healthcare company was like a $22 billion revenue healthcare company. So it's big. So they had some big time leaders, you know, with, with what I was going to do. And I was the first person in this job. There was, I wasn't replacing somebody who retired or left. They just decided to have someone in this role to coordinate planning, design and construction across the country, country where in, in uh, prior to that, those that work of construction and design facilities was um, was done in each locale and so i know people say don't ever don't ever take the job that's just been created you know because you they don't know what they're getting and they don't really know if it'll work but i did but this this person said to me um regarding the the bigger issue of the spiritual side of what we were doing, you know, can you be present? Can you be present in manifesting, honestly manifesting this concept of why we're here? And you could get caught up in 100,000 employees concept of being with a company that large uh, you can get caught up with physical you know the physical aspects of designing a hospital or building a hospital uh, you can get caught up with just sheer numbers but at, at, at the very core was people's um, health and and life he asked me you know, uh, knowing all this, can you be can you be present with this? Can you exhibit a presence all the time? And um, and I think that really, I'd never been asked it, 
and I never forgot it. I, and not only just in resurrecting it because it, you know, it came to mind when you asked me, but as I would, you know, kind of evaluate myself at times, I would, I would ask myself, am I keeping that in mind? Am I keeping that fundamental concept and the reason we're doing what we're doing, the reason this organization exists, am I keeping that present and not losing sight of it? And, um, and so I think, I think that one question on his part, uh, you know, really guided me in, in so many ways. I wish, I wish I had been asked it as a young person in the, in the original construction company. And, you know, when I was young, um, because I'm, I'm, I probably would have uh, improved a lot of, I probably would have improved a lot of encounters I had. That's, that, no, that's an excellent question. That's a super powerful. So, so in, in wrapping up, Bob, what advice would you give to leaders that are wanting to go to the next level, wanting to progress along their, their journey of leadership and development and growth? What advice would you have for them? Uh, if I if I knew the person already, and and not just somebody I just met and asked me, I, I I'm I'm inclined to say I really need to know the person to give the advice because, in my view of the person, which is only my view, but probably supported you know by help from consultants and others, I would have an idea whether I thought this person was right for the job or not or right for the for the progression even knowing there's progression after that maybe and so um i would i would just have a very very frank discussion about about what it's like and if i sense it has to do with the person's interest in development and growth has more to do with money. But, but, I, but if I had a, a real concern about his or her ability to deal with the newer issues that will come with that elevation, you know, then I'm going to tell them that. And I think one of the things that I thought about in, in uh, prior to talking to you today had to do with uh, a strong belief that I have, that I've had and learned um, to say what needs to be said. And I'm, I'm amazed at how many times in our personal lives and in our professional lives, um, it, people, we are reluctant to have difficult decision, uh, discussions with people. And it's so much easier to say something, um, tell somebody else. I tell you something that I really need to say to somebody else. And so I've had, I, I think I've employed that, that concept um, in, in discussions with people and let them know what it's going to be like in, in their new role and what may not, what they may not be aware of, or if if it looks like they're so well suited, then to talk to them about some of the things that we've talked about today. That they, if I can, if I can speed and help a person pick things up like self awareness or whatever, um, you know, then I would do that. But it isn't for it isn't for everybody. And I we had a. We had an estimator in the construction company who had been in estimating for a long time, and he wanted to get into project management, and he tried it, and I think he wanted to get in in it because I think he saw it as in a in this construction company we you know we had our cultural faults, and one of them was we we kind of put the actual project manager people management people on pedestals and um in for a time in my career i was in business development and definitely felt this second class citizen uh because i'm not out there building the work building the projects and um i think he felt like there's more money there's more 
recognition, there's more prestige. And he tried it and he didn't like the travel. I think he didn't like the higher level of risk in his decision making because in estimating it's a pretty factual straightforward you know um, effort it takes great skill and intelligence and and education but it's not like making lots of great decisions out in the field as to what to do when something happens he didn't like it and he came back in and and i just i gave him so much credit for doing that um and and recognizing that there might be some benefits to it but that he took another look at his role where he was and and felt like it's pretty good you know i had it pretty good and i and i should stick with it and he's he's now retired and was in that same role all the time and too many people i think see it as a um see it as a um a, and it's difficult when somebody overtly sees it as a, a ladder to climb and people recognize they they have a plan and i mean not, i'm not against having a plan for yourself but to not have it be so um evident to other people and just let it happen and usually if it usually companies i think is, as difficult as it is will make mostly the right decisions on who the company thinks should um should move on especially if it's a, a really terrific culture where they're not just looking at it without um, a real emphasis on what kind of person is this can they handle the tension can they handle the the um the risk and the adversity and whatnot and so i i mean, that's a really roundabout long answer um to a really great question and i'm not sure I, i've answered it adequately i can tell you that but i'm i i always i you know you know and i'm in st louis and sometimes i'll say you know years ago i just use an analogy um where i'd go to the baseball game the st louis cardinals and in the dugout every one of the players is wearing the same uniform they play different positions but they're all wearing the same uniform they're all professional professional they're not amateurs anymore they're all at the highest echelon of their field but there's only one albert pujols on that bench and so <laughs> there are different levels of talent in that in that case his talent just exceeded everybody else's ability and talent to to hit to make you know to be a batter and and so we have to recognize that that there are some people who who have exceptional talent in certain areas and and um and and the talent to go forward and to go further than they than they might be at a certain point and um and that's what it takes you know the the old adage that we make so many mistakes in companies where we we um we promote the best bookkeeper in accounting to be the manager of accounting and all of a sudden it becomes a people job and not a bookkeeping job and they're not necessarily suited and and uh and that's not to not their fault i mean they're not they're not wired that way and so i, I just, that's what i find so fascinating i think is is that concept of of um being recognized as being good at something and then <laughs> And then finding out that it, it brings a whole new palette of needs to manage and lead that maybe aren't as much, I won't, I won't say fun, but aren't as satisfying as what I did to get there. That's terribly roundabout. That was great, Bob. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. So many insights, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I only have about 55 more questions that we'll have to hit on another day but thank you so much for your time and your insights bob I really appreciate it you uh it's interesting i i you know we we sat at that large large table we could have never come into contact but it's um you know you've made a, a real impression on me with your enthusiasm and your attitude and your uh, dedication to what you do 
and I know it, it's a lot of hard work and I'm incredibly respectful of your experience in your past and what you've done uh, for yourself and for the country. And, and uh, I really appreciate it. It's been great meeting you and getting to know you a little bit. Thank you, Bob. That means a lot. This episode is sponsored by Classical Conversations. Since 1997, Classical Conversations has been equipping families like yours with the resources to homeschool with confidence following a classical curriculum rooted in a Christ-centered worldview alongside other families in a local community. Homeschooling is doable with Classical Conversations. Check out classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons for more information. Again, that's classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons, G-I-B-B-E-N-S.